as Dobbs is one of the most graceful creatures we all know. They have, what's unique about Dobbs is they have this amazing homing instinct. You can take any dove and drop off anywhere to find back home. They got this amazing GPS in their brain. Um, a test was done uh, many, many years ago. Uh, someone from um, uh, 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 England picked up a dove and took it down to Africa and released the dove. After 55 days later, traveling over 6,800 miles, this dove returned to home in England. How they do it? No idea. Some of us here, you know, if I drop you off somewhere in the city of whatever, and, and you probably won't be able to come back to your hotel room with, even if it's two, three blocks away. You know, doves have just amazing homing instinct. And I was studying about dove. It just kind of kind of uh, remind me about, like, Jesus, you know? Jesus has this amazing homing instinct. He came down from heaven, far away from heaven, came to here. Somehow he made it back home. You know, he's got this homing instinct, just like dove. Dove, and the Bible represents Holy Spirit, we know that. Every time there is, you want to talk about the presence of God, we take this dove and we, we show it. And the dove, the spirit of, of being able to give us hope, was portrayed in, in, even in the New Testament. I mean, I'm sorry, Old Testament. Noah's days. It was first, you know, Dove was released if there's any hope when whole earth was covered with the, was flooded with the, with the water. And the first time he came back, hopeless. Because there's no place for Dove to land. And it was released the second time. Dove came back with a leaf, giving us hope. Hope not be realized. There was a hope, or there is hope. There, water is subsiding. That means there's a place must, that Noah can go to land. And Noah sends Dove for the third time and never came back, giving us hope. Hope that's been realized so that Noah go, can go and land. Well, that kind of sounds like almost like grace. Hopeless? We're all hopeless? When you believe in, in Christ, there's a hope. And when you... When you Receive him through baptism. When you truly receive him in your heart, that's a new home. That to me sounds like very much like grace. And it is so. Second thing about dove was mentioned in the, uh, uh, in the baptism of Jesus. John 1, 32. And John bore witness. I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove. And it remained on him. It confirms that Jesus was the Messiah. It always means innocence. Jesus said, be wise as serpents and innocent as dove. Doves are also used to sacrifice the purity. Because it signifies the purity, the whiteness. And also symbolizes the peace that comes. So hold this thought. Dove, innocent, purity, peace, sacrifice, Holy Spirit, and the Messiah. This is the theme for today's message. So we are studying the book of Mark. The book of Mark is about what? It's about grace and the deity of Christ, meaning is Christ real? Is Christ really the Son of God? Is Christ really the Messiah? So Jesus, when he entered into this picture of our lives to teach us about the grace, he used parables. When we talked about that, why he used the parables, it was the right thing to do in those days. Jews love parables. I mean, they talk about stuff. And Jesus taught us 
about his deity, that in fact he is the son of God. To do so, he healed many, many, many people and performed many, many, many miracles. In his parables, he taught us about innocence. How also he needs to be a living sacrifice so that we can truly face and see the kingdom of God. How he is the son of God. Early on, however, no one knew who he was. Yeah, people acknowledged that he was some kind of a special man because he was doing these miracles. And he talked about kingdom, but not too many people knew that he was what he was talking about. Even so called his disciples, the follower of Christ, they didn't quite know who he was. I don't really blame them. Well, the grace is the essence of being a Christian. The grace in the New Testament justifies the prophecy of all testaments. The fact that grace is a free gift of God, that we are justified by faith, not by works. And second, that Jesus is the Son of God, not just an ordinary man. So to demonstrate these two elements, Jesus continues to show that he possesses the power that is equal to God. And he talks about the grace through the parables. So the question is this. Did Jesus, the disciples know all along who Jesus was? Or did they know truly Jesus as Messiah? Or did they really understand the meaning of grace while they were following well, from chapter 1 to 7 <clears throat> that we've been studying, Jesus performed all kinds of miracles, but disciples weren't sure. They keep saying to each other, who is this man that we're following? But interestingly enough, devil knew. And Jesus said, shut up, don't say anything. And you move on to chapter 8, Jesus finally asked disciples, who do you say I am? And they say, you are the Messiah. Upon hearing that, Jesus warned them. Didn't even say it softly. Warned them. You will shut up. Keep it quiet. Don't tell anybody. Chapter 9. They even now admit that Jesus is the Son of God. But, you know, they admit that Jesus is the Son of God. But they did not understand when Jesus said, rising from the dead. They were still far from understanding the meaning of grace. Without grace, there is no Son of God. And Jesus is trying to really portray that. So in chapter 10, Jesus continues to heal blinds, talks about how to have eternal life, that we need to be like a little kid to enter the kingdom of God. Then, all of a sudden, he predicts his death. So last week, chapter 10, Mark 10, Mark chapter 10, verse 33, 34, we're going up to the Jerusalem. And he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law, they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Still, they were not sure what three days later he will rise. They didn't know what that meant, just as they did not know what Jesus meant by saying, Rising from the dead, a chapter before that. They kind of acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God and Messiah because from all the things that he was doing, but they did not yet understand. 
the meaning of grace. Today we know the meaning of the grace because we know the ending of the story that changed the world, that changed our lives. What was after three days? It was resurrection. Disciples did not know about resurrection. Rising from the dead, three days later, you'll rise. They had no idea what that meant. Resurrection is the one that is giving the birth to grace. So even though Jesus was trying to teach them about the grace, they have really no way of knowing it or receiving it because the dove, the Holy Spirit, has not descended onto the disciples until Jesus was resurrected. Because that seals the, the important component of grace, that we are now truly forgiven and that we are restored. Now on to chapter 11, today's scripture. Chapter 11 is about Jesus going to Jerusalem. He is inching closer to the time of giving us that gift and revealing us his true identity, the deity as a son of God. Up until this point, they believed, the disciples believed that they've seen him doing amazing things. So as they were going into Jerusalem, things begin to unfold. So are you ready to travel with me to Jerusalem? With, well, when you're going on a vacation, you know, what do we do? Every time I go on vacation, take a little briefcase and pack all the things that I need from the smartphones to uh, socks to clothing. If you're going to Hawaii, you're packing Hawaiian shirts and all that kind of stuff we do. Just think about all the things to pack. Did they, what did they pack? You'd be surprised what they packed. Jesus simply said, just go get me a donkey. No smartphones, no clothing, just give me a donkey. And the disciples were like, what are we going to get a donkey? Here today, we need a car. You go to a rental car place and you pay the money and you, you get a car, a rental cars. But to those days, Jesus said, go get a donkey. And disciples didn't know where to get a donkey. So Jesus shows off his power once again, that he is truly the son of God. If you go that there, certain village, there will be a donkey tied. All you got to do is go grab it and bring it to me. And if somebody asks you, what are you doing? Just tell them the Lord asked for it. And that's exactly what happened. So they brought the donkey and Jesus brought donkey. Then all of a sudden, something happened. People began to shout, Hosanna. You know what Hosanna means? Hosanna simply means save, save, and save. We pray. Or literally means, I beg you to save, or please deliver us. Maybe people knew something that even disciples did not know. They shouted, the people, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom. What's the coming kingdom? It's coming kingdom through grace. Coming kingdom, coming grace of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. So Jesus goes to Jerusalem riding donkey. So we're all riding donkey together behind them. So in this chapter, we're traveling together and watching what Jesus is doing. Now, in this chapter, Jesus finally does something very out of ordinary. 
Before it was all about healing with uh, his uh, uh, God-given power to heal people, the blinds and death and, and leprosy, all right? He did the good things. He did here in chapter 11, he does things that will make you and I think twice about him, whether he's really real or not. Instead of doing what we would say, wow, he must be the, the son of a God or something to that effect, Jesus did something that is not like him. First thing he did as he was traveling through Jerusalem, he cursed a tree. He cursed a tree. Well, he was hungry. That's too bad. It's showing that he's just like you and I, he's a human. He was hungry. So he needed something to eat. So he saw a fig tree over there. He walked over there. But there was no fruit. Is that tree's fault? And the Bible even says it wasn't even the season for it. Of course, the tree's not going to have any fruit. It wasn't the season for it. Poor tree. You know what Jesus said to this tree? May no one ever eat fruit from you again. Why did Jesus say those things? If I was following, I'd like, is that for real? Mark uh, chapter 11, verse 12, 14. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry, seeing a distance of fig tree and live. He went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciple heard him say it. Wow. I wasn't, I'm not sure what you would do when you're in that situation following someone that you respected so much, you thought he was Messiah and Son of God and does these things. It gets worse. And you go down to verse Mark, chapter 11, verse 20. In the morning, as they were going along, when they went along, they saw this fig tree wither from the roots. It died. It's dead. So what do you make of this? What do you make of this? And the second thing that he did, that's out of ordinary, he's overturned the tables. Perhaps he got mad and upset. When he entered the temple area, and he saw people buying and selling, he got upset and overturned the tables of merchants. If you didn't really know who Jesus was, and saw these two acts, the things that Jesus did, it's easy for one to criticize Jesus as like misbehaving or using whatever power, abusing his power. If someone saw me do that, and I'm sure someone here would say, well, that guy's not fit for, fit to be our pastor and go find somebody who's more holier. Well, good luck. Why would he do that? Didn't he have any concerns for, uh, about his image and his reputation? He was concerned about his image and reputation. That's why he told devils and other people to be quiet when he performed the miracles. He was surely concerned about, maybe not image, but what is to come. In today's political environment, there will be political suicides. If you did something like what Jesus did. Maybe that was his intent. So in verse 1 of Mark chapter 11, it starts with, as they approach the Jerusalem. So now, Jesus was in ministry for three years. When Jesus approached in Mark 11, when was it in timeline? In that three years, it was in the beginning, in the middle of this uh, three-year ministry, or towards the end. Here's the cue. Disciple wasn't quite sure yet about what the grace is at that time. They were just following him. They've seen his supernatural power. 
It was someone special. They finally begin to acknowledge that he was Messiah. But remember, they did not understand at that time when Jesus said, rising from the dead. No idea. So going back to uh, timeline, when they approach Jerusalem with Jesus, what point in his ministry was this? Was it in the beginning, in the middle, or somewhere in the, in the end, or very, 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 very end? Well, surprisingly, it was only four to five days before his death. Can you imagine all this time his disciples were following him? Up until four or five days, they weren't quite sure yet. They acknowledged he was the Son of God, acknowledged the Messiah, but they have not seen grace or experienced grace or that grace, that event has not taken place. So really there is no way for them to understand. So what is he telling with those two strange acts? One might call it inappropriate behavior, misuse of his power by cursing the tree and ramping act of turning over the table. You have to keep on remembering what the book of Mark is about. The book of Mark is about grace and the deity of Christ. So, when he cursed the tree, he was not cursing the tree. He was telling us the serious nature of the condition of Jewish church state at that time. Meaning that Christ went to temple, began to reform the abuse of its courts, and came to show that the Redeemer has come, but they will not accept him. They were not bearing any fruit. And later, the fig tree withered and died, meaning that those who don't accept or believe in the Redeemer, the Christ, they will wither also. In other words, anyone who rejects Christ will wither. What was that Jesus was trying to demonstrate to us? Sort of his final act or final warning. Jesus is beginning this is important. This is beginning to show us the consequences of not believing in his grace and his deity. It's that powerful. What does this mean for us as believers? If Christ comes today, can we say, can you show the fruits in your lives? Or is, is it empty? In the Bible, fruit of spirit contains joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, and self-control. Are we bearing fruit with this? If we say simple things as a believer, forgive somebody, that's bearing fruit. If you say, I'm sorry, I misspoke, that's bearing fruit. Simply say, I will do it, I will sacrifice, that's bearing fruit. I will tell the truth. I'm not going to keep my mouth shut, I am going to tell the truth, that's bearing the fruit. If you lift somebody up, that's bearing the fruit. So what about the uh, second behavior? Behavior of overthrowing the table. Let me ask you, when someone comes around and just, without any explanation, and overturns the table, what do you think? In today's American culture, that would be pretty bad, wouldn't it? Well, my uh, grandparents' days, that would be like early 1900s, 
well, overthrowing the table before somebody, it's just making a statement that I am upset. It's just a statement. You think that's bad? Well, think about generations and generations before your grandparents' generation, or even your father's generation, to indicate, to show that you're upset. What do they do? They killed you. Look at the days of Renaissance. Look at the days of, you don't even have to have go far. World War I, World War II, and places in Europe, in Asia, if they don't like you, they're upset, you're dead. So, turning over the tables, is it really, really bad? Well, you be the judge. Well, I got another one for you. When I was in the hospital, I often see this never really watched soap opera, American soap opera, but 26 years ago, being in hospital six months, after reading Bible, guess what I turned? Soap opera. <laughs> Trying to pass the time, because I can't really think with all this medicine going through my body and brain. What is so interesting about American soap opera is every time a woman gets upset, they slap a man's face. It's like, what? But man can't do that. I have not yet seen a man slap a woman's face in a soap opera. But lately, later days, I will start watching Korean dramas. It's like that's similar to soap opera, Korean dramas. You never see a woman slap a man's face. It's a cultural thing. It's a cultural thing. It's actually the other way around. Man slaps a woman's face. For Jesus, he was making a statement. He's making a very clear point. It was like showing what grace is like using parables. And he tried to explain what grace is using parables. Here now, instead of verbalizing it, he's showing it with his actions. Mark chapter 11, verse 15 through 16 on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changer and the benches of those selling doves. And would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple court. Now, we know what we're talking about. Many times we talk about in a church, the temple is a place of worship, it's a place of house of prayer. It's not a place to display uh, the merchants and buying and selling. We get that. But what is amazingly interesting, because the Bible is written by God and the Holy Spirit inspired every word, every word are important. It means something very, very special. Merchants most likely had many, many, many items. But the Bible verse singled out what? What the Bible singled out in this particular case? He singled out one item, doves. It wasn't talking about pigs or what else did they trade in during the gold? Nothing like that. Doves. What's that? Lambs, yeah, it's doves. What is dove? We talked about it. It's a hope. It's a sacrifice. It's a Holy Spirit. In other words, they were buying and selling the grace. When you take a hope and sacrifice Holy Spirit all together, it's like, it's the grace. And Jesus is saying, grace is not for sale. Grace is not for sale. You can't be doing this. Regardless of whether it's temple or not. Let me repeat, of all the merchants, he singled out doves. His action is like parables. What he would normally explain in parables, he showed them with his actions. Remember that this took place four to five days 
before his death. It was his time to let us know the consequences, the consequences of not believing in his deity and grace. What is it? It's the spirit of judgment. Showing what it will be like on the day of judgment. He will return to purge the bad. That's why we, the evangelicals, are seeking to have all our friends, people around us, to receive grace so that they don't have to face these consequences. In closing, the book of Mark is about grace and the deity of Christ. A dove was mentioned at the baptism of Jesus. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. Dove represents the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit was with Jesus. Jesus predicted his death, saying that the time is near so that we could see and finally receive grace. It was this death of innocence that will bring grace to us. The dove affirmed Jesus is truly the Messiah. And the consequences of not receiving grace is this. Those who do not, their life will wither like fig tree down to the roots. But those who does, the Holy Spirit will descend upon them like dove so that we can experience the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you so much. It took three years.